Now's the time set for oral argument in cause. What do we got first? Manager. There you go. In cause number 1CACV 190055FC. And that is DeFrancesco v. DeFrancesco. And is that pronounced correctly? Enough, is, there, is there a better way to do it without? OK, thank you. Uh, for everybody's information, these proceedings are being audio and video recorded. And we're now live streaming as well. Uh, so you can look good for the folk. Um, so barring any audio or video, video problems, uh, you can critique yourself in a couple of weeks. I'm sure you guys are well familiar with that process. Council, each side, as usual, will be, will enti will be entitled to 20 minutes and we would ask that you respect that time period. The timer on the podium will let you know how much time you have left. And again, I'm sure you know that well. Uh, appellant, if you wish to reserve any portion of your 20 minutes for rebuttal, please let us know so we can avoid taking up all your time if the, if the mood strikes us, I suppose. However, ultimately, you need to work at reserving that time for yourself. Uh, we've reviewed the briefs. We've conferenced the case this morning. So we are well aware of the facts and issues attendant to the argument. Um, you might keep that in mind uh, when it comes to how you apportion your time in regard to your argument, both of you. Um, counsel, when you come to the podium, I would ask that you state your name and who you represent. And with that, Appellant's Counsel, you may begin. Thank you, Your Honor. May it please the court, uh, Steve Wolfson and my partner, Michael Sherrick, on behalf of Appellant Adrian DeFrancesco. Um, I will reserve uh, five to seven minutes at the conclusion just for some brief rebuttal uh, with regard to the pending issues. Um, with the exception of the personal property issue, uh, which the parties largely resolved um, with IR 117, a stipulated order uh, this past June, there are four pending issues in front of the court. So, so that one's off the table, personal property in the house? I, I believe so, Your Honor. I mean, that, the, that well, parties... We'll ask. Uh, can we get a stipulation of that, counsel? I'm not aware of that, Your Honor. Okay. okay. Then let's, well, let's just go forward and let's use that as our standard. How's that? Um, but I'll take, we can take a look at it in the record. So. That, that, that's fine. We'll, we'll uh, rest with regards yeah. to the arguments we previously made on, on that particular issue. Uh, aside from that issue, we still maintain that the court erred with regards to the determination and wife's earning ability as it related to the calculation and determination of spousal maintenance. Uh, with regards to the determination of the arrearage issue as it related to prior ordered child, excuse me, prior ordered spousal maintenance, both under the May 2018 order and under the decree of legal separation from 2012, as well as ordering a conditional payment, a payment that did not go beyond another condition set by the court, that being namely the sale um, uh, or the anticipated sale of the party's home, which actually has already occurred. Um, number three, the division of the World Series bonus received by husband in the fall of 2017 and the court's denial of the award of attorney's fees um, in the decree and then later in the order dated December 3 of 2018 following the entry of the decree and the award uh, of attorney's fees to appellant. Um, with regard to spousal maintenance, we think this is a fairly, and the and wife's ability to earn money is, is a fairly straightforward issue in terms of the court's reliance on uh, information not in evidence at the time of trial. Well, there, speaking of what was in evidence, what did your client, didn't your client testify that she'd made nine job applications? Uh, I, I believe there was between 9 and 15. I think she may have said 11 during the time period of the case. So there was evidence before the court of efforts to obtain additional employment above and beyond the part-time employment that she had had for the, for the better part of the past 24 years. Um, that is somewhat ancillary to the court's finding that she had the present ability to walk into dental hygienist work at the amount of 32 hours a week. And I think... Uh, Council, is 32 hours a week a magic number? I mean, most people might say, typically we work 40 hour weeks. If the, if the court is looking at assessing all that, 
he assessed it on a 40 hour week, didn't he? She, excuse me. Well, the, the court, uh, did a combination, um, and in the decree referred to both the combination of part-time dental hygienist work mm -hmm. by Dr. Sparks with a Dr. Sparks and a Dr. Miller, as well as the retail employment that wife had also obtained to supplement her income. So between the two, the court came up to a 40 hour work week. The point we've made in both our uh, initial brief and in the reply brief is that there was no evidence put before the court, no vocational evaluator, no other investigation, no evidence with foundation that wife had the present ability at the time of trial in August of 2018 to walk into or to obtain um, full time or well, 32 hours and answer your question. Um, it wasn't a magic number for anyone other than the court. And it appeared in, in husband's pretrial statements saying that he didn't expect wife to have full time employment. He only expected her to have 32 hours of employment and claimed that it was available through various internet searches, which had no foundation and which were not admitted as evidence at the time of trial. But, but isn't it possible that the court didn't abuse its discretion by concluding that not that she could just walk into a job, but that with more effort than she testified to, she could find another eight hours of work a week someplace in the Valley in a dental office? Uh, I, I can't speculate exactly what was in um, Judge Cooper's mind at the time. I can only speak to uh, the, the written basis for her decision. And that was um, that, 30, that she could work 32 hours. She didn't indicate what the 32 hours was based on and the only evidence well the only information not evidence in front of the court was this proposition that there were all sorts of other jobs available when wife testified she said i have these other jobs i've been making the effort to put together more work for myself but on any given week it doesn't add up to uh, more than what she had reflected in her affidavit of financial information so she testified that above and beyond her efforts, um, which were, I believe, accepted by the court to be good faith efforts to, to obtain additional work. I mean, there certainly wasn't evidence that there were no, e no efforts. Right, right. But the, there, there are a lot of dentists in, in the Valley. Couldn't the court have said, well, she, she made good faith, but not, uh, not diligent enough efforts? Well, she, the, the court could have said that, but that would have again been contrary to the record because wife testified that not only did she put her resume out there, not only did she make application, but that it wasn't one size fits all in, ter in terms of dental hygienist work. At 57 years old, she didn't have the same skills that any other or, or every other dental hygienist might have in terms of what was needed in particular offices. And she testified to the court that that was a barrier to her working in some offices. So to answer your question again, there may have been in general lots of dental work, lots of dental hygienist work. It did not mean, and there was no evidence in front of the court, that wife was capable of entering into just any job in Didn't any capacity. Didn't she also capacity. testify about uh, a number of places that she hadn't applied to that seemed to be hiring at the time? I, I don't believe so. Um, I, I, I recall that there was cross-examination. Did you apply here? Did you apply here? Did you apply here? And she said no to all of those. Well, I think also on redirect to the extent that she was asked those questions, and I believe that there were foundational exhibit, excuse me, objections to those questions because there wasn't evidence in front of the court that those were positions that were available to her. She indicated, again, that she lacked certain skills, that she wasn't in the running for many positions just because they were open. Would your position be that a, a family law judge cannot, absent some type of study, employment-based study, find based upon um, general understanding of the, of the job market that, that there's going to be a certain number of hours of work available? Or just say, I don't know, but I expect you to find this amount of work. Well, I, I mean, judges do that, uh, family court judges do that all the time as a matter of temporary orders. There's the encouragement, there's the expectation,
that's voice to to litigants on both sides. Husband and this and isn't wife. a formula case, right? I mean, this isn't a formula case where if she has X number of income, then you automatically or you're presumed to. So the judge gets to set its own amount of what it thinks is a fair and appropriate amount of spousal maintenance, right? But to answer your previous question, that is exactly why we have Rule 63 and why the court very often uses Rule 63 to either sua sponte or upon request of either party to appoint a vocational evaluator to assess the specific abilities of any person, any spouse coming before the court requesting spousal maintenance to determine what can they specifically do and can they do it full time? Can they only do it part time? Are there specific jobs available? And that's really the issue here. And, and I agree that's an option, but is it is it mandatory? Is there anything in the law that says that a court has to do that before reaching a conclusion about what it thinks a person should be able to earn? I don't think it, it's in the law that that's a requirement under 25319, but in the exercise of evaluating all the factors in 25319, that would show a lack of evidence, a lack of specific or detailed evidence for the court to rely upon in making its decision. I mean, that would just be spe general speculation about, well, I think husband can be this type of accountant if he does X, Y, and Z. Well, unless there's expert testimony or more specific evidence in front of the court, I'm not really sure how any judge could come to that conclusion without totally speculating. Um, As my second question, it, am I right? This isn't a formula case where if he says, well, she makes this amount of money, then it's this amount of No, 25-319 relies on the, the totality of the evaluation of the factors, both in A and B. A is the gate mm -hmm. that you walk through to get to the B factors, and B 1 through 13 then are evaluated by the court in terms of deciding how much and for how long. And in this case, the, the issue of how long is not on appeal. The issue of how much is directly related to, uh, under the decree... The other findings made by the court. And more specifically, on her finding with regards to the ability to earn 32 hours plus another eight hours in retail. So once, assuming the court found that there was an inadequate basis to find that wife had the present ability to earn 32 hours as a dental hygienist, as opposed to the amount that she had been historically earning, and the Social Security statement, which is um, uh, in evidence, um, uh, page 227 of the transcript, Exhibit 92 from trial, showed no more than 28000 per year over the entirety of her earning history. You know so what? there's no history here. I'm afraid you're going you're gonna to run out of time. And uh, I want to ask you about the World Series bonus. Absolutely. This week. What, I want to ask you about the burden of proof. Uh, 25 213B says that property acquired after service of the petition is is sole and separate. Why didn't your client have the burden to show that that rule didn't apply here? I, I'm sorry, if, if the court could rephrase its question. Okay. I'm, I'm curious about the burden. Because the, the burden is always on the party opting out of community property because the overarching principles and presumption is that everything acquired during the marriage, and unless the court's asking about the I time period, because I, I think it's the rule is everything acquired up until service of the petition is correct. community, but the bonus came in October 2017 after service of the petition. Correct. So why didn't your client have the burden to show that, notwithstanding uh, 25213B, that was community property or some part of it was? I, I understand because I don't think there's a genuine argument that because his contract, um, uh, Exhibit 1 at, at trial, uh, was begun prior to termination of the marital community, so the second action, that, that there wasn't community labor expended to obtain that bonus in October of 2017. Well, I think, I think there is a question about that. And why, why, that seems why to be was, the whole dispute. That's, that's the issue. And why didn't your client have the burden to put on evidence to show why that was the case? Why well, the general rule didn't apply? The, the, our argument is that the contract and everything flowing from the contract establishes the initial community interest in monies received through employment. But don't you have to show that if you're going to do that, you have to show that there was something earned prior to the filing of the, of the if you're going to rely on the contract. Now, this, this is something, this is basically a gift as I understand it. But aren't you going to have to show that some portion of that was earned 
prior to the filing of the petition? Well, even husband concedes that it was earned as a result of being an employee during the time of the Astros' march to the World Series in 2017. I'm not sure he does. We'll ask him. We'll ask him. You don't. I believe it exists, and I'll provide you the page number. But the contract, Exhibit 1, doesn't say I'm entitled to a bonus if my team wins the World Series, does it? No, but you could say that about any payment occurring after, for example, June 1 of 2017. Right. But first of all, in the decree of legal separation, the parties established an intention not to abrogate the community because they were continuing to have the deposit of all earnings into the joint account. And so the statute would apply, right? Well, I mean, the argument is, and this was not briefed specifically in the reply brief, that their intention under page 2 of the decree of legal separation was not to have the termination apply. They specifically say the parties shall continue to hold property jointly. I think you're confusing us because I think you moved back to the 2012 decree of legal separation. Okay. We're talking about the petition here, so. Well, and getting back to the contract establishes his relationship with the Houston Astros. And so the argument that we would make is that it's only as a result of being employed with the Houston Astros, an act which occurred prior to termination of the community, gives rise to a partial interest because there's community labor expended prior to termination of the community and community labor working for the Astros done afterwards. Do I understand you to be saying that the separation agreement somehow abrogated the rule that we look to the date of service of the petition for dissolution as the date that you divide between community property and sole and separate? I think going forward from 2012 it did. But, yeah, well, no, my question is, does the date of the service of the petition for dissolution matter here like it normally does? It does because it separates community labor from non-community labor. I thought you were saying that the separation agreement somehow abrogated. No, I was giving that by example of what they had originally intended to do. They then had a filing in 2017 which then terminated the community, but there was community labor expended prior to that termination, which there's no proof put in front of the court at the time of trial, prior to the time of trial, that there was absolutely no connection to the entirety of husband's employment with the Houston Astros. That's like saying he just walked off the street and for whatever reason they decided to give him a fractional interest in a World Series bonus. So you're saying his labor earned him the bonus? Absolutely. All the way back to when he started with them? Well, at the very least, at the beginning of the Houston Astros contract. So that's why both the trial and now we continue to say there's a proportional interest. In this case, it's pretty much six months and six months, which is why wife had a fractional interest in the World Series amount. Although as I think of it, actually your argument could go back for as long as he worked at the Astros, couldn't it? Well, all the other earnings. It wasn't an annual bonus. It was a World Series bonus based on his history with the Astros, arguably, right? Right, but all the other earnings were supposed to, under the decree of legal separation, an existing order of the court to be deposited. I mean, that's the whole other issue with regard to the arrears. Does the record show whether husband had any remedy? Let's say at the end of the year the players or whomever decided not to give him a fractional interest in the bonus. Does the record show whether he would have had any remedy, contractual or otherwise, to say, no, I'm entitled to that? We've never argued otherwise, that it's discretionary on part of the team, but that doesn't change the fact that it was received, again, based on his work during the entirety of his time with the Astros, which actually began pre-2017. So the payment is discretionary with the team, but his obligation to his wife is fixed? I'm not, well, fixed under community property law would be our argument, that when you expend community labor and that community labor leads to the acquisition of property, as it did in this case, that there's an interest, just like we have with division of retirement plans. 
Um, there's, a, there's a separate interest that's accrued post-termination of the community, and there's an interest that's accrued pre-termination of the community. retirement plans, you have an undisputed, irrevocable contractual right to those benefits that have accrued at the time of the separation. I don't see that he did here. I, I don't, I mean, every retirement plan is different. Um, I understand that, that the court may not like the analogy, but the, the use of community labor, I believe, is, is undisputed because he was working for the entirety of that time for this one team, and the, there's no evidence that there was something specific did done. It wasn't as though he reached a benchmark, or he, uh, uh, unlike uh, maybe some other contract where you uh, have some accomplishment that only leads to that, and that accomplishment is post-termination. That's not what occurred here. He was working for the team uh, as a minor league coach, then went up, um, but regardless of what he did or didn't do, it was all related to that employment um, during the entirety of his time with the team. That, that, that remains our argument, and I have about a minute left. So thank you with discretion of the court. May it please the court, my name is Stanley David Murray and I'm representing the appellee, Anthony DeFrancesco. Obviously we're asking the court to affirm all of the rulings made by the trial court in both the decree and the post-decree motions, as well as we're seeking an award of attorney's fees on appeal. In regard to the present spousal maintenance award, there was evidence to support the trial court's ruling here. This isn't a matter of uh, lack of abuse of discretion because there wasn't any evidence to support the trial court's ruling. But what was the evidence that she could find more work? Mrs. DeFrancesco <laughs> testified that she had worked one to two days for Dr. Miller, one to two days for Dr. Sparks. So if you take the high end, that's four days, eight hours of work day, I suppose, at $38 per hour. Plus, she also had a third job working in retail. So there's your 40 hours. Was that important to the court? Did that seem that getting to that 40-hour mark was significant? Actually, the 32 hours was significant as far as her working in her chosen field of dental hygienist. Except for the retail. And then she included the retail in this, right? But the retail is de minimis. I think it's only like $360 a month in addition. The fact is that the expert witness that we presented testified about how she could survive on the 32 hours of work week with the dental hygiene, hygienist position, plus $2,000 monthly in spousal maintenance. So her gross income from earnings would have been up to 5,000 plus 2,500 that uh, the court did award is $7,500 a month. She may have testified she could work one to two, but did she ever testify that she could work two days per week at each of them? I, I think that's yes. a bit of a stretch to say, she, especially when her history was that she never, I think, had more than 24 hours in a week at, at any of those places. Mm -hmm. Am I misremembering the record? She did testify that she had worked full time as a dental hygienist. Define not in recent define history. Full, not in recent history, no, sir. And when you say full-time, define full-time for me. 40 hours. Okay, so she had worked as a dental hygienist for 40 hours a week. She did testify that historically she had. That was back in the early days of their, their marriage, I think. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Okay. But still, I mean... But I mean, on the, on the <laughs> issue that you just proposed, which was one to, two, one to two days per week at each of them, we'll take the high end two and say 32. I don't think that accurately summarizes her testimony, which was... In, in the record, which was she hadn't been able to get 32 hours a week at those two places. Well, if she testifies one to two days uh, for all these various doctors that she's working for, I think the court was justified in finding two days a week with each doctor is justified at four days a week as a dental hygienist. Um, I don't think she contradicted it. And besides, the burden of proof would be on her, by the way, in terms of having a vocational expert testify that you can't get more than 32 hours as a dental hygienist in Phoenix. So the burden of proof would have been on them to refute any kind of inference the trial court might have had. Didn't as to her she ability testify to work. that she hadn't been able to get up to 32? Didn't she say that she was at 24? Actually, she, I think she said she worked at 10 hours a week, which became a matter of credibility for the trial court to determine if that was legitimate or not. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll ask your opponent when he gets back up. But, uh, Okay. I, I seem to remember testimony that she had said something about that this was all she could find was based on what she'd been doing recently. Okay. Well, again, she's able-bodied, too. There's no question about her physical ability to work a full uh, 40 hours a week, let alone 32 just in dental hygiene. 
Um, but also we have to look at the needs, what the wife's needs were. She testified that she had over $6,000 worth of expenses that need to be met, but the court didn't believe that either and reduced that significantly. So when you look at how much she needs in spousal maintenance, not only do you have to take into account her possible earnings, but also her actual expenses. And at $2,500 plus the $5,000 that was attributed to her, she's got more than enough to meet her expenses. We didn't cross appeal, so I'm not challenging the $2,500 award, but on this record, it was sufficient. As far as the World Series bonus goes, that was earned or received after service of the petition. Defined earned or received. Paid. How do you say it was earned or received? It was paid after the World okay, Series. So it was received after service of the petition. Your point says you've conceded, your client's conceded that it was earned before, at least in part before. Well, I think I found the page that he's okay. referencing. It would be page 30 of my answering brief. We'll get a head wave or not. 30 of the answering brief, okay. <laughs> and I stated, as noted by the trial court, the bonus was paid simply because the Houston Astros won the World Series in 2017 and husband had been a former employer of that organization during that season. And I'm quoting from IR 66 at page 14. So yeah, I didn't get the bonus from the Houston Astros when they won World Series because I wasn't affiliated with the team, but Mr. DeFrancesco was. And it did nothing to do with the fact that he had over four years working with the Houston Astros wasn't guaranteed in any kind of contract. It wasn't deferred compensation. Was it contractual? No, sir, it was not contractual. In fact, if you do have an issue about this, I'd ask you to remand it because the Houston Astros did not pay him that money. It was the team, the players union who decided that. Uh, Look, can, do you mind? Sure. Let's say he had been hired mid-season two days after the petition were filed. Would he have been, is there anything in the record to let us know whether that bonus would have been the same, less, or greater than what he actually received? We have no idea what the bonus, how it was calculated. Or what, is there anything in the record to suggest that people who got, who, who joined the team later in the year than he did also got the bonus Nothing or joined the, record, the organization? Sir. Not that I'm aware of. And who fact, would have been, who there's would have no been evidence the, at all in the record about the bonus, other than it was paid, right? Other than it was received. I don't want to say paid, apparently. Yeah. It was received in October after I'm sorry, service. I didn't mean to interrupt no, that's, I'm done. <laughs> and it was received solely, wholly because they won the World Series, not because he had contributed hours earlier in the season to make it possible for those players to be in shape to win the World Series. Exactly. It was fortuitous. It was like winning the lottery or a gift. I don't see any kind of compensation that the community would be entitled to. Well, what about what, although. It is true, according to the statute, that a payment received after service of the petition is sole and separate property. Say I'm at a law firm, I get my monthly draw, I serve my petition for dissolution November 1, December 15th, I get a nice little bonus from my law firm. Is my, is my spouse not entitled to any, my former spouse, not entitled to any share of that? Yes, if your former spouse can prove that it's based on past services attributed to the corporation or the company that they're compensating that person for, compensating you for. So the proof would be what? What sort of proof would? <clears throat> that it was based on past performance, past service. Wouldn't there be something presumably, I mean, sitting, the, each of us are kind of to some degree experts in this area. <laughs> Wouldn't the income of an attorney be presumably attached to some portion of an agreement whereby there was a, an amount paid, an amount withheld, or, or an entitlement, an expectation that if certain things occurred, there would be more money at the end of the year? Yes, sir. That would be based on a compensation theory, either deferred or something expected in the future. And does that exist here? No. Winning the World Series is not something that you can expect, although you plan for, I'm sure. But it's not something that you expect and expect to be paid for. Or as deferred compensation, yes, you do expect to be paid for. Or a contingency fee contract. If the attorney did the work during the marriage, it doesn't get the payment or the judgment paid until after the papers have been served, then that would be a deferred compensation entitlement that's c completely contrasted to what the situation is of the World Series bonus. Let's change the lawyer hypothetical a little bit and talk about a contingency fee where a lawyer works for a while for a firm on a, on a case that you only get paid if you win mm -hmm. and then leaves the firm and goes someplace else and the contingency fee is the case is won and the firm compensates him for his work done prior to that. Is is that different than this case? 
Yes, that would be the Garrett case, and that was a situation where the work was done during the marriage, but wasn't compensated during the marriage. Compensated after the fact, the community had a right to compensation because of the labor that was put in. This World Series bonus is fortuitous. It's not something that you can expect. And actually, my client worked for a minor league team, didn't even work for the Houston Astros, part of their farm system. But he wasn't on the team that won the World Series, so for them to compensate him was an unexpected gift. So it was fortuitous in two respects. Fortuitous for the Astros, fortuitous for him. Exactly. Go ahead. I've got other questions. Go ahead, though. No, I think I'm good. Why did the court not abuse her discretion, its discretion, when it, at the end of the day, on the maintenance or rearages, when it said, if you don't pay the equalization payment by a date certain, you don't have it, then what, then the, then the rearages payment is wiped off the books. Why wasn't that error? Because it was a temporary order under Maximoff and even under the PSA, the property settlement agreement. The award was family support. It wasn't spousal maintenance. So it had to be changed in some sense because the children had already matured. So what we're talking about is a spousal maintenance award that was temporary in nature, both at the time the decree of legal separation was entered and at the time the temporary orders were entered. So your point is the court had the power to alter it at any point in time, and what the court ended up doing was to alter it to eliminate it. Yes, ma'am. Effectively. The court had that discretion. It's not vested. You don't have a vested right to temporary order payments like you would in a final judgment. And so all those cases that they cited, Jarvis and et cetera, about these vested installments doesn't apply with temporary orders because under the statute itself, 25-315 and Maximoff, it's subject to modification. In fact, there's got to be a modified order because you go from temporary orders to permanent order of the court. So at the end of the day, it's going to be addressed a second time regardless. Yes, sir. Otherwise, it would have been a permanent order from the start. Right. At the same time, the judge can always change her mind under Rule 83A1. There's nothing to prevent her from changing her mind based on reassessment of the situation, and that's what she did here. She decided that Father, or excuse me, Mr. DeFrancesco could not afford it except for the proceeds from the refinancing if wife did the refinancing, and since she didn't do that, then the issue became moot. I believe she had that discretion to do that. Does the record tell us whether the house has now been sold finally? The record doesn't tell you that, but I think we can agree that it was sold. It was sold. Yes. I just want to talk real quick about the arrearages, too, the way it was calculated. I don't know if you had a chance to go through my math, but I hope I did it correctly. It's not $10,000 that's owed here. It's maybe $3,000. And again, as far as the arrearages between, let me see if I can get those dates correct, up until March 1st of 2018, $5,500 was the spousal maintenance award. Prior to that, though, my client was to deposit his entire paycheck into the joint account. Well, the entire paycheck was approximated at $6,000, but in October of 2017, it was only $1,200 because he was leaving the Houston organization, Houston Astros organization. So he did deposit his full amount. So the only arrears that could be assessed was based on that $1,200. He paid it, so there's no arrears for that month. And then as you go through each of the other calculations that were based on whether he made a full deposit or not, he made the majority of deposits. And so when we came up with the math, we came up with $3,000 that was being owed, and there were some overpayments as well. But again, I don't think that calculation is necessary because the trial judge had the authority, had the discretion to determine all this has been modified to zero. All right. Attorney's fees, real quickly. Again, the court has the authority to change its mind. Judge Cooper reassessed the situation when she initially awarded fees. It was simply based on the fact that a contempt petition had been filed for nonpayment, and then she realized, I guess, that my client had made those payments, not in the full amount necessarily, but that there was some confusion as to what his obligation was, and so the judge changed her mind and reversed her order on attorney's fees. Again, all within her discretion. So she concluded, she went back to her original, both of you have been unreasonable, not that 
husband has been even more unreasonable. Correct. And also the no disparity, because you have to look at the after decree assets as well. She's now getting spousal maintenance. She's now getting half of the retirement accounts. So they're both on this even level as far as financial disparity goes. I really don't have anything else unless the court has any further questions. Good. Thank you for your time. Um, in, in reverse order, um, it's our position that the court did not have the discretion once it had ordered attorney's fees without any notice to reconsider. Uh, court misapplied both the standard under 25324, uh, referring to a substantial disparity. What's your when, authority for the, that the court can't change its mind? Well, because there was no, there was no defect in the application for attorney's fees such as might occur under Schweiger v. Chinadoll. Court didn't note any problem with rate, with description of the attorney's fees, any other factor that has to be fulfilled under Schweiger. The court uh, made an erroneous uh, conclusion, legal conclusion, that because she somehow, excuse me, the trial court misunderstood the previous proceeding on temporary orders, which really wasn't an evidentiary hearing, that she was going to excuse, that the trial court was going to excuse husband's failure to follow the earlier PSA and her order. So it's an objective standard under Williams. It's not a subjective standard. So you're saying that the court, once something is announced from the bench, has no latitude? It, it might have latitude depending on the circumstances. The circumstances here, given that there was a proper application for attorney's fees, it was not a proper exercise of the discretion to simply Dis, have it disappear. The court could have properly exercised its discretion to say, I'm going to cut off uh, the award of fees as of this date, or I'm going to reduce it to a particular amount. But to go from an award, which was properly justified in terms of the documentation of the court under Schweiger v. Chinadoll, to then saying, well, now I've rethought the whole thing, and I'm, a, I'm applying a different standard, both in terms of uh, 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 relative financial resources under 25.324 and the reasonableness using subjective rather than objective under Williams, that is the error that occurred here. But, um, but, but I thought that what what the court did, what the court did is under under 25.324 she she rethought reasonableness and she in thinking about the what Mr. Murray just related about the sequence of separation agreement agreements and the deposit obligation and the change of employment, it was more complicated than she had thought. Well, and, and therefore, she, she, it concluded that it would be unfair. It, it, it might have been, but that didn't change husband's obligation to comply with the PSA, not to have acted unilaterally to cancel and uh, freeze the, the HELOC, which was entitled to be used under the PSA. She was correct to begin with. Well, it didn't change his obligation, arguably, but it, it but I think if the court was looking at the reasonableness of his contention that he didn't have that obligation, that's what I understood the court to be pointing out. Uh, possibly, but it, it appears from the wording of the decree, and in fact, not the decree, but the 12-3 minute entry, that the court supplanted her, the trial court's <laughs> confusion with husband's reasonableness. So that that's where I believe the error occurred okay. in saying subjectively the trial court was confused at some point in time, and therefore I'm letting husband off the hook in terms of what he did in terms of not paying, which she cited again, and she even in fact cited not paying going all the way prior to the March order. So even she, the trial court recognized that the decree of legal separation requirements to deposit the paycheck were in play as far as determining an arrearage, and that didn't occur. So to say husband doesn't have to comply because the trial court was confused at some point in the proceedings, doesn't apply an objective standard. Counsel, thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. May, may I, no, no, go. Since I cut counsel off when he was going to offer me a site, She's have, being you found generous, the, have you found the Let's site? Go. Oh, yes. In the trial transcript, if, if that's what the court's referring On to. On earning, conceded earning, that's the... I, I'm sorry? Whether husband conceded it was earned. Oh, that is, is the same uh, okay. citation, page 30 of the answering brief right. that, that Thank you. Mr. Murray referred to. I thought the court was referring to when wife did testify that she had previously looked for employment and that her reference to three to four days a week was not every week. So the court, to combine them consecutively to say it's a total of four, that was an error in reading the record. Thank you, counsel. We appreciate your argument. We really truly do. <coughs>
<coughs> we're going to take the matter under advisement at this time, and we will issue our decision in due course. Thank you very much. We're adjourned.